Welcome to our third in the series of Nature at Home webinars, or should I say Crabinar, Walking Sideways Through Life, which is hosted by the Victorian National Parks Association, in case you haven't noticed. Uh, my name is Cade. I've had the pleasure of working at the Victorian National Parks Association and hosting tonight's webinar featuring Dr. Gary Poor, aka Mr. Crustacea, and Shannon Hurley, Victorian National Parks Association's Marine Conservation Campaigner. And then I get to host for myself at a short spell at the end. Before we begin, tonight we at the Victorian National Parks Association acknowledge the many first peoples of the area now known as Victoria and honour their continuing connection to caring for country. Uh, we offer our respects to elders past, present and future and I personally am on Wurundjeri land and offer my respects to the elders past, present and future and any that may be here with us tonight. The Victoria National Parks Association has been at the forefront of nature conservation for almost 70 years. We share a vision to have a diverse, healthy, natural environment protected, respected and enjoyed by all. ReefWatch is the marine citizen science baby of the Victoria National Parks Association in that it's only been around, I mean only been around for 15 years. It's powered by the community and their love, knowledge and passion to learn more about Victoria's marine environment. I'm just going to give you a quick rundown on this evening because we're going to take you through for a journey through Victoria's amazing marine environment, focusing on the crabby inhabitants. Now, something I think we're, all of us in Melbourne are feeling a little bit at the moment. Quick rundown is we're going to begin with a update from Shannon Hurley, our marine conservation campaigner, on the hashtag Save Our Spider Crabs campaign that has been running for some time now, which is then going to be followed by what I have been promised is going to be an absolutely crab debating. And don't worry, there'll be more bad puns as we get through this. And hopefully Gary, who should be the master of these, will have some for us as well. Crab debating presentation to help us all learn a little bit more about the crabs that call Victoria home by Dr. Gary Poor. A, basically a world authority on crabs. He's going to finish up after about 30, 35 minutes and that should hopefully be at around 10 to 7, which I will nip your ears for about five minutes. Before we start, I'd like you to take a moment to think about your earliest crab encounter. Um, I think most of us, I think everyone's had a crab encounter of some sort. Um, or if you have kids and a bad memory, think about the first time you got to introduce your kids, your kids to crabs. Mine for me was when I found what I thought was a dead crab. Uh, turns out it was a molt, and my dad explained to me that crabs shed their skin and it creeped me out. I had nightmares thinking that I was going to wake up one morning and my skin was going to be laying next to me in my bed. So look, while you're listening to the presentations this evening, keep your crab in mind. If it is a spider crab, congratulations. Shannon's definitely going to mention it, and so will Gary. If not, Gary may mention it or he may not. Either way, I'm hoping tonight's speakers can inspire you to join us on a little journey to learn more about our crabs and other equally fascinating marine life. So to kick off the proceedings, tonight we have an effervescent bundle of knowledge and joy, Shannon Hurley. Shannon is a nature conservation campaigner at Victoria National Parks Association, and like all of us here tonight, is inspired by the world around her, especially when that world is underwater. While she could talk extensively about most creatures under the sea, and she actually often does, Tonight, she's focusing on one, the humble spider crab. Over to you, Shannon. Thanks, Kate. Hi, everyone. So grateful to be here with you all tonight. And I actually didn't even write that intro. So thanks very much, Kate. That was a really nice one. So um, everyone, I'm going to be giving you a bit of an insider into the Save Our Spider Crabs campaign. Um, and why they actually need protecting and what you can do to help. So um, I'm just going to share my screen with you all. Okay, so is everyone ready to talk crab? So I certainly am. So for those of you who might not have experienced this amazing marine spectacle that we call the spider crab aggregation before, um, or you might not even know a lot about it. If I was to say to you that we have a world-renowned marine spectacle right here on our doorstep of Port Phillip Bay that brings in tourists far and wide, internationally, interstate, across Victoria, 
and is highly valued by locals on the Mornington Peninsula, was even featured in David Attenborough's Blue Planet documentary and a bunch of others. Crabs might not be the first things that naturally come to mind. But I think this is what also makes this marine spectacle so special. These bizarre alien-like creatures, this army of spider crabs which march in from the depths into the shallows every year. Sometimes I think that it might even be a scene from one of the Lord of the Rings movies. But some of you might be thinking, okay, well, why exactly do these crabs come into the shallows from the depths? And let me just, if for those of you who haven't had the chance to experience this marine event, I just wanted to give you a short little snippet right here. So if you put your mask and your snorkel on or your scuba diving equipment on, this is what you would be likely to see up close and personal with these amazing giant spider crabs. Some of them you might even see can be even eight or nine storeys high. Some of them fighting to get to the tops, the roof of their, of their own little crabby building um, to, uh, to shout out king of the, king of the castle. Um, and this is like some of what you actually get a chance if you see them in real life. And so some of you might be thinking, well, why do they come in from the depths into the shallows? And the answer is to molt. And what that essentially means is that they are shedding their, their clothes. And these crabs don't seem to have any shame in undressing all at once, all together. And there is a particular reason for that. And it is believed to be for protection in numbers against predators, which are gonna come and gobble some of them up, such as rays. But unfortunately, over the last couple of years, rays have shown to not be the only ones coming to catch these crabs, but more on that in a second. Amazingly, there's still a lot that we don't know about these crabs, such as where specifically do they come from, from the depths? And where do they go to after they all aggregate um, in the shallows um, in the, on the Mornington Peninsula, which can be highly visible from piers such as Blair, Gowrie and Rye Piers. So there's still a lot that is a mystery to these crabs. But what we do know is that it is a huge tourism draw card and this potentially high tourism value that these crabs bring into the Mornington Peninsula and to the Victorian economy in general. So what is the problem? So for the first time, the 2000 aggregation event, which usually takes place between the months of April and July each year, and it can vary on year to year, and we are seeing changes as the years go on, is that essentially what we saw for the first time last year and at this year's event was an explosion of crab catching during this time along the piers along the Mornington Peninsula. And with that, unfortunately brought environmental destruction and a public safety issue for many of the people coming to experience these crabs, whether you know in the water or sighting them from the piers above. And so what we saw was unfortunately, a lot of marine life happened to be caught in the nets that had been used to catch the crabs. And I should say that, you know, um, this was such an issue these last couple of years, just because of the sheer intensity of the people that were coming to, to catch these crabs and the nature of the, of the practices that were taking place. And so what we often saw was a lot of marine life either stuck in the nets here, just like this seahorse here. Uh, often we saw that there was crab nets being scraped along the pylons, which are, you know, for those who have stuck your head under the water are rich in incredible marine life. And with respect to the, the practices that were done here is that chicken carcasses were used to attract the crabs into these nets. And in some areas, there was as much as 80 of them in a really small area. Not only this, is that there happened to be 
thousands of small crabs actually taken before they even got a chance to molt, which is what they've actually come here in the shallows to do. And so when you consider all of these impacts in a relatively small area for one pier, you can imagine the, I guess, the, the risk that this has caused, you know, not only to the marine life, but the people involved in witnessing this amazing marine spectacle. And so some of you may have seen this being highlighted in statewide media over the last couple of months. And some of that included featured in The Age, both online and in print media, and also on Channel 9 TV and across radio stations across the state as well. So what we are concerned about is that without protection, we believe that the experience going forward from what we saw both last year and this year going forward really risks the high um, tourism value that this incredible marine spectacle has for many of us who are going to enjoy the crabs. And if we do not act to protect them, this could be at risk at future years going ahead. And so there is a solution which we believe, and that's why the VMPA um, are working with members of the Spider Crab Alliance and Spider Crab Melbourne, known as the SOS Save Our Spider Crabs campaign with a mission. And that mission happens to be for a, a measure which we believe is going to really address the issues that we saw last year and this year. And that is for a seasonal no-take period during their annual molting season between the months of April and July. And what we have been doing is really garnering the support from a range of different bodies and local communities and also the international community as well. And through our work over the past couple of months, and I should say that, you know, this campaign sort of started last year by others, such as the Spider Crab Alliance and Spider Crab Melbourne, but this year we have really banded together a, a much more concerted effort to give the crabs the protection they deserve. And so through our work so far, it is, we have shown that there is wide support for a no-take season to protect these crabs. And that support is shown, for one, from a petition, which probably many of you online here have signed, with up to 34,000 signatures. That is huge. Not only that, David Attenborough himself has handwritten letters on a couple of occasions. More than 50 statements of support from local businesses um, you know, educators, scientists, you know, fishers, and even, you know, local councils and, and MPs have had positive comments as, as well. And so we really believe that this is so important in the campaign going forward. And really, this has been the first step to show that there is widespread support for the protection of these crabs. And what's also um, I wanted to mention is that we have been liaising with and working with the Victorian Fisheries Authority who are the decision makers for the, um, how these crabs and the crabbing practices that are taking place are managed going forward. And the VFA have been undertaking some satellite tagging, which you may have heard about in the media also, shown by this little crab here, which you can see this weird look looking thing hanging off the back of his shell there is actually a satellite tag. And um, what they did was they tagged 15 different crabs over the last month or two, and, and the aim is, is that one of these satellite tags is going to pop off these crabs about one every, every week for the next few weeks and really give us, you know, some information on the movements of these crabs. But what we're concerned about, and even though this is a, a positive step in the right direction, this is not going to directly address the issues that we are seeing uh, this year in terms of you know, environmental destruction and the public safety issues here. And so we believe that we go a whole lot further. And so before I just get into what everyone can do to help, I just wanted to tell you uh, my chance at seeing these spider crabs this year, just before we began, we began to see um, a lot of the commotion happening at this year's event. And, you know, for a lot of people, seeing the spider crabs during the day is one thing, but seeing them at night time is a whole other kettle of fish. And I just wanted to play you this video here, which was footage taken um, from the spider crabs during night time. And I can tell you, it is definitely a whole lot more eerie than during the daytime. 
And me and my scuba diving buddy were actually under the pier. We actually didn't know where these crabs were at this time. And it was amazing. The first time I've ever seen a little broad nose seven gill shark. It was a little baby, not even, you know, probably only half a metre long. And we actually saw this little baby shark and he actually led us directly towards these crabs, which were not actually under the pier. And so this little aggregation of crabs was uh, quite a small little area than what I've generally seen in the past few years. But it was just incredible to see these crabs, you know, in person, just doing their amazing thing that they do and just totally just witnessing this in person. And so for those of you who may not have had a chance to see this yet, I'd highly recommend it next year's event. Keep your eye out um, and definitely go and witness this. For yourself um, you know whether it, that is from the pier directly or jumping in the, the 10 or 11 degree water it is definitely worth it and so some of you might be feeling a little crabby at the moment with what has and particularly if you've witnessed the event and what's happened this year and last year you might be wanting to help and so i wanted to say as well there's going to be a lot more opportunities in the future to help out but right now one of the best things that we can actually do Given the, the work that the team have been doing to work with um, support for this campaign is actually to elevate this further. And, you know, we acknowledge that there are other decision makers that can really actually make making a no-take season for these crabs possible. And that is particularly to elevate it with the ministers responsible for this area. And so that includes the Minister for Fishing and Boating, the Minister for Environment and the Minister for Tourism as well. And so we have, we are just launching, that has not been shared with anyone as yet, a letter that you can write directly that goes to these three ministers. And there is a, a template that, you know, you can do a quick and easy thing um, by putting in your details that will directly go to these ministers. But if you can take even an extra five or 10 minutes, it is definitely noticed more if you were to write your own letter directly from yourself and this has definitely has a lot more weight and we have provided some key points for everyone to do this and make it as easy as possible but definitely add in your own experiences in there as well in your own points of view and share that far and wide and you know as many people doing this we've got a better chance of actually protecting these crabs uh, as well. I also just wanted to give a huge shout out because, you know, whilst I'm up here talking to all of you at the moment, this has been a really amazing effort. And um, I feel so grateful to have worked with the, the crew from Spider Crab Alliance, Spider Crab Melbourne, um, and others in, in this campaign so far who are just so dedicated. And um, I also just wanted to give a shout out to their Facebook pages, but for now, um, sign the letter if you can and, um, and keep an eye out on DMPAs and the other respective Facebook pages to find out how you can help further. So thanks very much, everyone. Thank you, Shannon. Fantastic. Awesome. I think one of the amazing things is to see all the different groups working together, which I think has become something that VMPA um, have continued to do well, is to bring the community and to bring the group sort of along and join everyone together. But it's great to see the questions coming through from Shannon. Gary's already got some and he hasn't even started talking, so that's pretty good to see as well. So look, our next guest is someone who has spent over 30 years as, and I actually wrote this down as the head crustacean dude, and then thought I'd better look up and see what his official title was. But he was the curator of crustacean at Museums Victoria. He retired over 10 years ago, but like all scientists, retiring is just code for I stopped getting paid and I'm now finally able to work on what I've always wanted to do. Which from our conversations, I've gathered that one of those things is a synthesis of crab taxonomy, not for Victoria, not for Australia, but for all the crabs in the world. At least the ones that have been described because there's probably still plenty left out there. Gary, like all the staff I've had the pleasure of meeting at Museums Victoria is extremely generous with his time. As I mentioned, he's retired. He doesn't actually have to be here but largely due to the amazing work done by the previous ReefWatch coordinator, Wendy, Wendy Roberts. ReefWatch and the VMPA have had a fantastic relationship with the museum and access to the staff, which are incredible fonts of knowledge that share their knowledge with and their time willingly with us. So Gary has had a fascinating career spending his time in museums and field sites throughout the world, 
studying a group of creatures that has tickled his fancy, and then most importantly, finding ways to share his passion and inspiration with the public. So please make yourself comfortable and enjoy hearing from someone who I can safely say knows a thing or two about crabs. Over to you, Gary. That's me. Okay. Um, so where shall I start? I don't need to say much about spider crabs, that's been said, but I'm going to talk about crabs generally. Crabs, or brachyura, as, uh, as we in the crustacean world like to call them, are uh, uh, a fascinating group, or they, they kept me fascinated. I think first, before I go on, I should um, is in, introduce myself. Um, you, there's a large audience out there, some of whom know me, I'm sure, others don't. I'm, as Kate said, I'm retired from Museum Victoria. And my special subject uh, for all of that time was crustaceans. I was responsible for the collections and for research uh, in crustacean. And my, but within crustacea, my specialty is, uh, is taxonomy and syst uh, systematics. And I, some people say these are, these are synonymous. I say, well, there's one you can call taxonomist, someone who tells species apart, and systematists are people who look for things that species have in common. And you can see from these six images here, uh, that these four have something in common, these two more in common than those two, but these ones are quite different from those. So um, that's what a taxonomist does. She looks for things that are the same. These are all different species. These ones down at this end have a lot in common, uh, although they look quite different. The other thing I am is as a community ecologist, I'm interested in documented bio, documenting biodiversity. Now, biodiversity is, is, uh, is what follows from taxonomy in that uh, it requires taxonomy to recognise species. And, and, that's, and species are the units of biodiversity. But anyway, I'm here largely because of the because of the crabs, and I can't actually tell you much about crabs because I'm not an ecologist who studies single species. As I said a minute ago, I uh, I'm interested in crab diversity, and, and one crab is is no more interesting than any other. But the giant spider crab Leptomithrax gangradii was described in 1834. That's what's interesting to me. It was uh, described a long time ago. Uh, H. Uh, Henri uh, Milne Edwards is actually a Frenchman and he was working with French collections. And he named it after Monsieur Gaimard uh, in this little piece of text here. And it says it came from New Zealand. Well, in fact, it did not come from New Zealand. Um, and he never illustrated in 1834. Um, uh, it wasn't actually illustrated until a few years later by William Haswell, who described it as something completely different uh, and illustrated it very beautifully. So, um, um, and it was realized then uh, that it actually was an Australian species. So anyway, short, uh, here's, the, here's the question that Cade put to me, and, and Shannon's really answered it as well as I can. Why does spider crabs aggregate in, uh, in heaps or mounds or pods, they're sometimes called. Um, well, in fact, there's very little research. I've, I've been into the literature to try and find out if anyone's actually figured that out. And, and there are a lot of um, anecdotal stories. There are four species of spider crabs that have been studied in the world, one in the English Channel, another in the Adriatic Sea, in the Northwest Pacific and in the North, Northeastern Atlantic. So there are four different species um, related to our spider crab. Um, and they all do much the same sort of thing. They do come together in big, mold, uh, big pods or aggregations. And who does it? Well, adult males and females do it. There's never any babies there. Um, and they tend to do it in the autumn and the spring. And it's said uh, that they, they do it to avoid predators um, during molting and mating. Now, as uh, Kate indicated a long time ago, uh, at the beginning of this 
session, uh, crabs molt, so they shed their skin. And it's only when they shed their skin and start to grow a new one, which is soft, that they're able to mate. Uh, because the apertures, the, the gonopores, the, 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 uh, the method for transferring um, sperm to the eggs of the female can only happen when, when they're soft. So at that time they come together and, uh, and it's felt or it's thought that by coming together in large masses that they offer some sort of protection. And there is some evidence that the non molting larger individuals may actually sit on top of the other ones and you know, protect them in these large crowds. So anyway, that's all I've got to say and that's all that's actually been, ever been published really about um, um, why these do it or how, how, how spider crabs um, come together and not. There, there is very little experimental work or there's no experimental work and it's pretty much anecdotal. So I'm fascinated by crustaceans for other reasons uh, and crabs in particular. I started working in, uh, in Melbourne in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, an environmental lab um, uh, and then went to museum later. And my task there was actually to look at biodiversity and endemism in, uh, in local environments and not to look at one species, but to look at as many species as you possibly could. And so I worked in Port Phillip Bay and published on, on the impacts of the Werribee Storage Farm on the bay way back in the 1970s. When that work ran out, we went out offshore right into the deep sea and found enormous numbers of species, most of which were undescribed, and managed to get a paper published in Nature on, on, on marine diversity and, and how that um, might be estimated. And even more recently, we've um, worked with the CSRO in Western Australia and, uh, and studied biodiversity there and came up in, in all of these studies with at least 800 different species. Um, there's about 800 species in Port Phillip and 800 species of, um, in, off the slope of Western Australia. Um, and so I'm interested in, in lots of species and taxonomy uh, is, is the tool to, to study that. So more recently, I, because I had that sort of experience, I got, was invited by the Natural History Museum in Paris to join them in their studies of um, biodiversity in Papua New Guinea. And I, um, went quite late in my life, so my diving um, ex expertise was almost non-existent and they weren't going to allow to let me to dive, but I was allowed to sit on the shore and divers brought crabs in to, for me to identify. And they brought them in at such a rate that I couldn't, you couldn't possibly identify them as they came past my desk, so uh, I just gave them numbers. And, but, and these are the sorts of things that came past and um, Looking at that, why would you not be fascinated by crabs? Um, these are the most extraordinary, extraordinary creatures. So I sat there for two weeks on two different occasions and uh, identified thousands of species of uh, crabs and, and other decapods. So this webinar is really about the global diversity of crabs and uh, it's not about one species, it's about lots. So I'm going to just start very briefly, and you're all quite, probably quite familiar with this. What is a crab? Well, first, it's an arthropod. It's got segmented legs, you know, along with ants and spiders and millipedes and centipedes and horseshoe crabs. Uh, it's a crustacean, which is an arthropod with two pairs of antennae, and here's some other examples, which are not crabs. Uh, and just and by the by, an, an insect is actually just a flying crustacean. It's, um, it's derived from within the, crustacean, the pan crustacean, larger, larger crustacean group. Uh, within crustacea, the, uh, it's a decapod, and the decapods are those animals which have a carapace covering the head and the thorax. It's got little eyes on stalks, and it's got five pairs of, of thoracic legs. Um, 
So that's the one thing with thorax, where the tail has other legs. And, and it's a brachyurine, which is the, the scientific word for an animal with a short tail. And you can see uh, here that in crabs, these tails are very short and are tucked in. And this is a male and this swimming crab, and that's a female. And the eggs are carried out, oops, outside there. Now, these are, these are not true crabs. These examples here are not true crabs. I mean, they're not brachyurine crabs. So king crabs are not true crabs. These are the Alaskan king crabs. Porcelain crabs are not true crabs. And this is an example from Victoria. The hairy crab is not a true crab either. And that is, it's called Lomas herta. And those of you who dive or walk along the shore in Victoria, or Southern Australia will be amongst the only people in the world who will ever see this hairy crab. It uh, belongs to its own uh, super family, uh, found nowhere else and has no other relatives anywhere else in the world. And of course, hermit crabs are not crabs either. And those of you who are numerate will realize why um, these, these don't have tails tucked under and they don't have the right number of legs. So, They've only got three pairs of walking legs, which uh, you can see clearly here and there and there. And so they're not, they're not brachyurine crabs. So what, how many crabs are there? Well, we know that there are already described over um, 6,300 named species in the world and they belong to 103 families so it's uh, it's one of the most diverse groups of of crustaceans in victoria we're quite lucky in a way we don't have to deal with so many species there are 51 species in subtitle victoria or intertitle and subtitle victoria and they belong to only 16 families but there are many new species being discovered by researchers in other parts of the world uh, and that number of 6,300 is just growing daily. But the chances of a new species being discovered in Victoria is extremely small. Um, the other curious thing about crabs is it doesn't, uh, is, isn't, doesn't come to mind immediately is that 22% of 1,500 species are actually terrestrial uh, or freshwater. Uh, and they range, of course, from the uh, Christmas Island crab, which is the one on, uh, which is this one here, um, which is quite famous for migrating through Christmas Island through the forest. Um, and this one here, which is from South America and lives only in the little wells and bromeliad plants. Um, so uh, crabs uh, are, are everywhere. But there are to me uh, terrestrial crabs in Australia. There's in fact only seven. So the center of diversity for coral, uh, for crabs is actually the Coral Triangle. It's this region in just north of Australia. And this is actually, the, it's, it's called a biodiversity hotspot. It's in fact, it's the biodiversity hotspot for many, many groups of, of animals, not just crabs, uh, it's for fishes and for corals and for echinoderms. And, and, the, and the, the density of uh, species is highest in this area and it, just dissipates uh, out from that uh, hotspot through the Pacific. Um, now crabs range, for, as, as I said, they can be terrestrial, so they can go up to the top of mountains, 2,000 meters high, and they go across the shelf, which is this bit here, down the slope, into the abyss, and they're down, found at 6,000 meters, which is about as, well, beyond it, it's certainly, uh, a long way down into the trenches, but not at the bottom of the deep, deep sea trenches. The other point to make about these two maps, uh, which are obviously bits of us, include bits of Australia, is the crabs in the tropics here, uh, in northern Australia, that bit there, are almost exclusively separate from the crabs that live along the southern coast. So, um, the southern part of Australia, Victoria, where we live, has a high 
level of endemism, meaning that the crabs we find in southern Australia are not found elsewhere. They're not found um, in, in northern Australia. So there's a big, there's a line across the middle which uh, divides the, our continent. Now, of course, that's, there are exceptions. There are crabs that go on both sides, but, um, but by and large, it's true. So the largest spider uh, crab is, a, is a, the Japanese spider crab, Macrocara kempferi. And this is a photograph of one taken in the museum in Vienna. Um, and it's 3.7 meters across its legs, which is, um, which is about as big as the room I'm sitting in. Um, weighs 19 kilos. The other um, big crab is the Tasmanian giant crab, which uh, occurs on the quite close by on the shelf in, a, in uh, southern Australia, southeastern Australia. It's 40 centimetres across the carapace and it weighs about as much as that one. So it's a pretty sizable crab. Now the smallest crab uh, is, um, is a false spider crab. It's called Elaminus, uh, Elaminopsis minima and it's 1.7 millimetres across, which is, um, which is that. Um, and it's about 3.5 millimetres across the legs. And that's what it, and that's actually not it, but it's, uh, uh, it's, it looks a bit, it looks a bit like that. So it's a, it's a hundredth the um, diameter of, of the biggest crab, or it's actually a million, so in mass, uh, with a fair size range in crab. Now this is the last species of crab that was actually described from um, from the Victorian waters, uh, which I described 10 years ago. It's, it belongs in that same genus and it, uh, and it occurs off um, Bass Strait in, uh, off Gippsland. And it's, um, as you can see from this scale, it's actually not much bigger than, than the smallest crab. So the chances of finding another sizable crab in Victoria, I think, are pretty low. So we know the fauna moderately well. I'm going to review the families of crabs, not 103 families of them, because that would take quite a while, and the subtleties between differences between them are sometimes quite uh, quite difficult. But I'm going to start first with crabs that you're unlikely to see and then come to ones that we uh, are more familiar. Um, so you're not going to see vent crabs, so smokers or hydrothermal vents are quite deep in the sea, but there is a group of crabs there called the Bithograds that live on chemosynthetic generated uh, material. Um, they're quite colourless, almost blind. Um, they occur throughout the Pacific um, Ridge. Carrier crabs, and there's several families of carrier crabs. These uh, have little leg, the last two pairs of legs are, are adapted to carry things. And this one's carrying a bivalve, and this one's carrying a kinodem. Um, uh, some of them carry sponges, uh, and they tend to be deep water, deep water crabs. Uh, there's a beautiful video that you can search for on the web of this animal actually moving around. Some that uh, spanner crabs you probably as is familiar to you if you go shopping in markets here. It's it's edible and it comes from Queensland. There are other uh, spanner crabs, this one from North America. Moon crabs live in coral reefs, but all um, beautiful, uh, colorful animals. These from the tropics. Coral crabs, here's two quite different uh, groups of crabs that are called coral crabs. Um, the cryptochirids live inside little cavities in, in, in coral and actually don't, don't move out. They get uh, enclosed once they 
start to grow, the coral grows around them and encloses them, and the trapezids and tetralids are, uh, just live on, on living coral and feeding on the mucus that the coral generates. Reef, reef crabs, uh, like carpilids here, are, um, again, tropical animals that we're not going to see in Victoria. And calapids uh, are box crabs, um, which, uh, again, are tropical uh, animals, which have this remarkable little claw down here, which they use for opening hermit crabs. They're also called shame-faced crabs. Now, I put that in because I'm not too ashamed to promote this book, which is produced by Museum of Victoria. And it's really, it's going to be a talking point because one of the things that Sh uh, Cade asked me to talk about was how do you tell crabs apart and how if you were a diver um, and, and you're photographing crabs, how can you identify them? Well, you, you have to buy this book, I guess. Well, Cade might give you one. So here are some crabs that are represented in, in Victorian shallow water. Um, and I'm going to start with sponge crabs. Um, just to prove that names, sponge, common names actually don't tell you anything. Uh, sponge crabs often carry sponges around and there's, there's one that's doing it. Um, but they also carry um, ascidians as well. Um, so, um, and there's only five species in Victoria um, and you can tell them apart. Um, by looking at them, the shapes of the carapace. Yeah. It's, it's not obvious here, but this one's got spines around the edge of them, this one's got little lobes, this one's got a little fringe around its top. Swimming crabs, again, there's only five species of swimming crabs in, in Victoria. Uh, the European shore crab, the sand crab, um, rock crab, ridge swimming crab, and the, and the Queensland mud crab. It's pretty rare. It does occur in eastern Victoria, uh, but you're more likely to see it in the markets. So, yes, only five species, but um, in Papua New Guinea, uh, there was this, just dozens and dozens and dozens of species of, of swimming crabs. In fact, the group is so diverse that it's now divided up into seven families. We used to call, call them Portunity, uh, but now now there's lots of other different families. This one I find fascinating because it's a swimming crab. It doesn't really swim. It lives. It lives in the in the um, in the the, uh, the bum of uh, sea cucumbers. Ghost crabs and sandball crabs. Um, there are two species living in very muddy environments. Um, um, they often have long, well, they do have uh, eyes on long stalks. And these are not found in Victoria. This is a, the ghost crab that runs around in the sand in the tropics, if you uh, had that opportunity. And signal crabs or sentinel crabs um, go as far south as Sydney, but we don't see them here. So, so just a, some quick lessons, uh, you know, this isn't a lab talk, we, unfortunately, uh, about telling species apart. Some are actually quite easy. Um, if it's, you see a soldier crab, uh, it, it's, there's nothing like a soldier crab. It, it's, uh, it's a spherical little ball, walnut with, with legs. The red rock crab is very easy to tell. Uh, it's got uh, little eyes in slots and lives in very rocky um, exposed places. The six-legged crab is um, easy to tell because it's got six legs and it's, and it's, very, it's simple to tell one from another. Some um, crabs are a bit more tricky to tell apart. These are pebble crabs and these are the three species which are common in Victoria. And you can see that the carapace has slightly different shapes and spines and so on, but, uh, um, but and you'll find these amongst seagrass particularly. But pebble grabs in Papua New Guinea were just uh, overwhelmingly 
diverse and, and very colourful. And of course, when you're sorting uh, or trying to identify things live, it's, um, it's somewhat easier than you know, doing it in a museum that specimens are often washed out. But there's quite a diversity of shapes and sizes, but they roughly have this very smooth, well, they all they have, no, they don't all have smooth, <laughs> they don't all have smooth carapaces, but because some are quite rough, but uh, and they all belong in this family called Leucozoidae. So, but there are some crabs in, in Victoria which are actually quite difficult to tell apart, and, uh, and camouflage and spider crabs are amongst them. Um, partly because as a, when you're diving, you, you just see this, this sponge or the camouflage with algae or sponges in this case. Sometimes not, but here they're carrying with little bits of algae. And to tell them apart really is, gets to be quite tricky. You've really got to turn them over and count the number of spines and the relative positions of, of spines around the, the orbit of the eye and the sides of the carapace. And you know, this one's got spines, that one doesn't. These are far apart. This one's only got one point, whereas but these have two. Um, and so if you're taking photographs of uh, sponge crabs underwater, it's really best just to turn them over and take a photograph of the bottom. Now this is the Leptomistrax gamodii, which is the big spider crab, but there is actually another species of Leptomistrax which doesn't uh, swarm or doesn't aggregate, and it's, uh, it's just got a slightly different pattern around, around its eyes. So it gets pretty subtle. And then of course there are things that are, look like sponge crabs and aren't. And the bearded crab is one of those. It's a, a local. Now I could go on at great length about telling one crab for another, but with, unless you've got them in front of you, it's not that easy to do. But so we have several species of shore crabs, uh, intertidally, under rocks. Uh, many species of stone crabs and hairy crabs, um, which are sometimes very subtly different from each other. This one uh, is, is relatively easy to identify. And, and several species of false spider crab, um, which tend to be in, in amongst algae and are quite small. But here's spider crabs in Papua New Guinea. Again, extreme diversity uh, in the tropics. Now, having uh, said that, uh, we have a great uh, uh, level of endemism here. We have actually two exotic species that are established in Victoria. Um, Carcinus minas is the European shore crab, and it's been in Victoria for at least 120 years, uh, and it's. Uh, and it's extremely abundant in, um, in the inlets in Western Port, in uh, uh, Lake Tyres, in that area. Uh, it's, it's very, very abundant, and, and you can see it quite common, uh, commonly along our shores in, in Port Phillip as well. Um, so it's an exotic species, and it came here on the, on the backs of ships or underneath ships. Um, and it's also been distributed quite widely around the world. Another species, which is also, again, has come from the United, uh, come from the Americas, North Americas, is uh, an American spider crab. And it's the only spider crab uh, which has a little, it, it's got a point in, the, in its rostrum at the front, whereas all the other ones have, all our local ones have, have two. Uh, again, it's, um, it tends to be in quite muddy environments. But there, is a, there are other exotic crabs which have become widespread in the Northern Hemisphere and our biosecurity people in Australia are uh, very anxious that we don't get these uh, um, species turning up here. One of them is the Chinese mitten crab, which tends to live in estuarine environments and, and also into into freshwater and lower reaches of rivers. It's called a mitten crab because it's got these 
got these little mittens, these furry mittens, more like a muff. Um, and if that gets into our river systems or lower estuaries, then they, they're just extremely, extremely de destructive, which has been proven in, uh, in Europe and the UK. Um, and then there are other crabs, which, so that would be very easy to recognize. If you see one, um, you, know, you should let the authorities know. Um, this one here, Harris's mud crab, is, um, looks like any one of our little shore crabs um, to the total observer, but uh, it, is, um, it is something worth, worth watching out for. Um, but again, these animals are carried by uh, in ballast water and, uh, and could be established here at, at any minute. I just wanted to, to end by uh, advising the divers that uh, these books are out there for you to, uh, from the, available from the museum. Um, and I think they can even be ordered online. Um, but they, would, uh, they will help you getting, getting started with trying to identify one from another. Um, this book here I wrote some years ago, but it's, uh, it's now out of print. You can buy an electronic copy of it, but if you're really, really getting serious uh, about crabs and other uh, large crustaceans, that's the one to have. I, I make no money out of it, I'll say that. Um, and I just added uh, this here bit just to show that viruses are not the only things that are named after crowns. This is Quadrilla coronata, um, which is the uh, corona coral crab. Um, and, uh, and at that point, I'll say that's that's uh, my life in crabs, and I'll call it quits. Yes, you can get Gary's books online. Um, I have one here, and I now understand the title quite well. The crabs, I think my screen needs to be flipped, but crabs, hermit crabs, and allies. Uh, all makes perfect sense now. Thanks to you, Gary. Um, thank you. That was Crabulous. Um, I'm just putting these back up on my back bookshelf. Uh, I'm sorry that I can't hear the groans to my bad jokes, but I know they're out there and I can feel those vibes that are coming my way. Um, hairy crabs are now on my list of things to go out there and find, um, as is Papua New Guinea. I was there anyway, but you've just made it even more appealing and I'm sure people are feeling the distance that everything's away at the moment. Um, and you did raise the idea of a lab session, which is something I did speak to Gary about, um, is potentially getting Gary back at another time if people have photos and questions and to sort of drill into this a lot more. So I guess for all the crabnatics that are out there to really get into it. Uh, based on tonight's talks, conversations I've had with like, a lot of divers and also a great talk that was given by Matt MacArthur, um, one of Gary's protégés from, from the Port Phillip Eco Centre is pretty much this sort of idea of how little we know about our crabby friends. Although Gary's just told us that we know all the ones in Victoria. But as I'm sure Gary will sort of be one of the first people to say, is we may know a lot about their existence, the taxonomy, but general ecology um, and um, broader information around them is sort of lacking. Um, and I think we find that for most marine creatures in just about anywhere in the world, unless they have a monetary value or they are extremely cute or they're very charismatic. Um, there's a lot of sort of paucity of information around them. So I started to think of two things. One is basically what is the simple way that we can learn more and two, how can we get people excited and interested in them? So I've already crossed off the second one. That was basically you've experienced that right now tonight and sort of now on to the first. And I mean, the simple way to learn more was actually the seed of the idea came from a conversation I had a few moons ago with P2 Hirschfield, who is here tonight. And she's an inspiration for many things, but I think this one was purely incidental. PT mentioned that the Spider Crabs Melbourne Facebook has a huge number of photos from spider crab migrations over the years, which made me think fantastic. Each and every image tells a story. Or the scientists in me thought amazing, each and every image can be converted into a data point. From a single photo, we can learn that a crab was at this particular place in time. This seems obvious, but this is hugely important when it comes to multiple observations over multiple times. You can also tell if a crab's recently molted. 
or you can tell if it's on its own or if it's part of a large group or if it's being predated upon, what habitat it is actually on, what the water clarity is like. On top of this, because you know the date, time and the location of the image, you can also find out information such as the water temperature at the particular location. But not only there, but also out in Bass Strait, if we're talking spider crabs, you can find out what the tidal cycle was at that particular time the photo was taken, the moon cycle, and even look into what the wind was like. So thinking that you can get all this information from one image was quite exciting. Then my heart sank a little because the realist in me realised that it would be prohibitively time consuming to sit down and do this with all the images that are there. And then only recently did I sort of cotton on to a way that we can perhaps make this a bit easier. And it basically started with my son. I've got a son who's about two and a half years old and we head down to the local river during the lockdown period. I'm fortunate enough to be able to access the Yarra as well as St Kilda Beach. And part of what we do is go, go hunting for critters. So we look for caterpillars, we look for butterflies, we look for crabs, we look for everything that's there. And every time I see one, he wants me to take a photo. And what occurred to me was what happens to this photo? Like, am I going to keep this photo or is it just going to get lost in my phone scroll sort of there forever? So something I started doing a while ago, I sort of rekindled an interest back in iNaturalist. So iNaturalist is just simply put as a place to put your observations that can be turned into data. Basically, what I've got, I've started to create for him is not only a gift for him, so all the critters that he's seen over time, but it's also a log of various animals and look I'm doing butterflies and moth that I know nothing about and I'm now starting to learn about them myself so it's sort of teaching me quite a few things but it also provides information for other people that may want to use it. So look I worked with others including Paul Sorison who's actually here tonight, thank you Paul for helping me, to set up the Marine Life of Victoria iNaturalist project. Details will be coming through the chat soon um, and the idea is that each, if each and every one of us just spends a little bit of time uploading their images and putting them out there for people to identify, we're going to end up learning a huge amount and we're going to share the load between us. I'm going to get preachy here in that each and every image you upload to iNaturalist will actually become a legacy. So you have to think of what you do with your photos. How many of you have photos sitting on your hard disk gathering dust? So I'm seeing nod from one of the panellists. I'm assuming that is something that we're all suffering from. I think Gary's even got a bit of a nod there as well. Yeah. So look, we're all guilty of it. We all have this incredible information sitting there, but it's basically going to waste or it's lost in our social media scroll. Like you might get, you know, doesn't like when you put it out the first time, a couple of hundred if you're a really good photographer, but it gets lost, it disappears, and it basically becomes forgotten. This is just a simple way to put that photo into a place where that information gets stored, becomes a legacy. And look, one of the other reasons is that once you, you know, your critter, your plant, the algae, whatever it is you've decided to take a photo of has been identified to research grade, and I'm not going to go into the mechanics of that, but it's part of the iNaturalist platform. Um, among all the other uses it can have, one of the things is that it ends up on the Victorian Biodiversity Atlas. And so for those that aren't familiar with the Bio Victorian Biodiversity Atlas, and look, I'm basically reading this off the Department of Environment, Land and Water and Planning's page, the Victorian Biodiversity Atlas Species Observation are a foundation data set that feeds into some of the many biodiversity tools used in DELP's everyday decision making, showing where wildlife is now and how this has changed over time. This makes its core input to the majority of the government's processes and programs that impact native species. It is used in conservation status assessments, habitat distribution models that feed into the strategic management prospects and native vegetation removal regulations and into our public land management, research activities and state of the environment reporting. Uploading your images is a simple way to contribute and a great legacy. It is extremely daunting to start with. Uh, part of the reason we had this tonight or was to do around the spider crabs, but it was also to get Gary on board. But it's also, if you're gonna start with something, start, just put your crab shots in, pick a species, put all your crab shots in there and start working on them. Or when you're allowed out, start finding your crabs, start documenting your local area. If you're not very familiar with um, identifying things to species or common names, or really familiar with anything that's out there, and that's part of the reason you're here, fantastic. Start on things that you see that are quite common. Uh, but to be honest, one way that you're going to get to know if things are uncommon is by documenting all the common things first. Then when something unusual turns up, such as a couple of the crab species Gary was talking about, you'll sort of have your eye and you'll be able to say, ah, I haven't seen this before, this is worth investigating. 
one of the great things about data that you put on iNaturalist is that it is open and transparent, which means it's easy to interrogate. Anyone can have access to the information. And most importantly, it's available to everyone. Now, before I get the question on people using the transparency for nefarious reasons, such as trying to find where certain things are, the data can be obscured so only yourself and project administrators can see it. And also iNaturalist will automatically do this for any endangered species that have already been flagged. So hence that. The other question I often get is around the use of images, particularly from photographers. Um, to all the photographers out there, you get to choose the copyright you want to apply. So if you don't want it to be used by anyone or you want them to seek permission before they use your images, that is fine. Several images have been used for scientific publications, scientific journals. One of the coolest thing I saw recently is a mola mola, which is a big sunfish washed up on a beach in Malacuta. And within one tidal cycle, Di Bray from the museum was able to get someone down there to collect a tissue sample for genetics within one tidal cycle. So this is an amazing power in this. And part of it is also being able to get a multitude of people involved. So it's not all sitting on the shoulders of one Dr. Gary Poor or one Di Bray or Martin Goman. It sort of shares the love. And look, Di, Gary, I'm sure are first to say that they've discovered things as the result of people helping out or sending them something unusual that they're like, oh, what is this, Gary? I've never seen it before. So look, there's always a way to have an impact. But be warned, it can become addictive. One of the things it does is it uses um, machine learning. So every time you put an image in, it will use that information to help the next person predict what it is they've found. It's not going to be right all the time, but for some of the common species, it's pretty creepy how right it can be and quite fascinating at the same time. And just to give you an update, I wrote it down today. The number of crustaceans that are in iNaturalist for Victoria is 875. Most of them are in freshwater. That's just observations. It's only 99 species. The number of spider crab observations in iNaturalist at the moment are 70 observations. So there's a huge amount of information, probably way more than that information, just sitting on every everyone's hard drive that's watching this tonight. So more information to come, but please keep that in mind. And I'm looking forward to seeing some of your shots. If you haven't listened to our Marine National Parks podcast project, I highly rec recommend you do. It delves into the story of Victoria's world's first system of marine protected areas and how they came into being. Thank you again for joining us and a huge thank you to Nicole and Jesse who have been scuttling around sideways behind the scene, running their virtual legs off to make sure that tonight flowed so well. I'd also like to thank the many supporters and donors that have tuned in tonight. The VNPA is a small organisation that works collaboratively with many other organisations and most importantly with the community in an ongoing effort to ensure Victoria's natural assets can be enjoyed now and protected for generations to come. Your support means the world to us. If you would like to get more involved or are able to support us, that would be amazing and greatly appreciated. I hope you had as much fun as I did, and I look forward to checking out your snaps on the Marine Life of Victoria iNaturalist page. Take care of yourself and your loved ones and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you very much.